This is such an exciting day for all of us, and I just want to thank uh, our football players uh, who are in the back of the room who have a special interest uh, in this area. Uh, we are going to have to excuse them because they must have for tomorrow's big game. Yes. So, uh, thank you for being here for our, our big announcement. So, welcome to a very special lecture on regional economic development by Dr. Jerry Callahan, who will hear from you. Jerry serves as Vice President for Innovation and Collaboration for the Van Andel Institute and Director of Hope River Ventures and Hope and Life Science Ventures Fund, all in the Greater Grand Rapids, Michigan area. And a few minutes ago, we had the opportunity to meet some former residents of the state of Michigan. I thank you for joining us. Jerry has bachelor's and master's degrees in business administration a master's degree in information systems management, and a doctorate in organizational leadership. He has formed two private equity and venture capital investment firms and has launched several startup companies. Today, Jerry will be sharing his personal observations and lessons learned about transitioning Western Michigan from a pure manufacturing economy to a more blended in our current state, in our current West Virginia economy, which has predominantly not relied on income for the coal mining industry, the Eastern Panhandle now has a significant opportunity to drive economic growth through knowledge, technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, and collaboration with Shepherd University serving as a capital. In recognition of today's distinguished speaker, including our special West Virginia legislators and attorneys, I am pleased to announce the Shepherd University establishment of the Center for Regional Innovation, which is described in the folder newsletter as you enter the conference room. Please stay tuned for more details as our co-directors, Dr. Scott Beard, Dr. Ben Martz, and Dr. Colin Nolan, Today. They will be unveiling the operational plan for the center of the Thank you. 
I'm going to be talking about the region. I'm going to be talking about the small stuff that South Michigan, but even West Michigan is, is number four here. There's a handful of counties in West Michigan that we consider our best health service area that don't have material. Um, and that's the group. Uh, we're one small state activity that we're going to talk about today. So let me start with that promise. Uh, this is Dallas Regional Center uh, in, in Michigan on the, on the uh, west side of the state. We have Grand Rapids, we have Grand Rapids, and we have Grand Rapids, and we have Detroit, and we have Detroit, which is uh, Detroit City proper, uh, but some counties and uh, some home counties and central state counties are the counties that represent that. But Detroit, obviously, is much larger in population. Labor force is uh, slightly bigger. Uh, unemployment is, uh, is significantly lower. Uh, and not as much today as it was at the time of 2009, there was just a reference point after the 2008 bubble hit. Uh, Michigan was at the 15th worst state in the region and had one of the highest unemployment rates. So um, if we took Grand Rapids out of that, the Grand Rapids region out of that, it would be a significant degree of 2% of the population that in the region. Uh, so they were at the time 16.1% of the unemployment rate, 79 in the region, which is about 10 in the last 10 years. The numbers are obviously quite different. Uh, it's not fair to comparison because I didn't do the whole region. I only have the Detroit information. That's the fourth province with that perspective. Um, uh, and then obviously our sales tax, our, our corporate tax, and our, and our personal tax is pretty consistent. Uh, it's, it's really been the same thing. Now let me overlay uh, and, and try to make the, make the argument that, uh, that West, West Virginia as a, as a region and uh, West Michigan as a region aren't all that, uh, aren't all that different. And so um, the numbers here will bear that out a bit. Uh, Population-wise, in in certainly in the ballpark, uh, labor force-wise in the ballpark, unemployment rate closer, much closer than Atlanta, which is close to 65, as we saw in the last slide. Um, average income is also closer to 62 um, um, than Atlanta and Detroit. Uh, gross domestic product for the state and for the region is considered to be consistent. And our tax base is very consistent. Um, uh, with, you know, with, with the uh, state sales tax and corporate tax and our personal income tax, there's a few percent of a bit higher on the high end, other than our development at the lower and lower higher class. So one, the one uh, area that, that is fairly that's pretty difficult is, is the education uh, achievement. So high school learners, we're, we're definitely in the same ballpark. High school graduates in, in our region about 87 percent versus about 16 percent. Um, high, uh, that falls up pretty quick in West Virginia, 17 percent for, for bachelor's degrees in West Virginia, <coughs> and uh, 36 for us, and 9.4 for postdocs or for um, uh, advanced degrees uh, versus but that aside, yeah, the, the reason I, I went through all these numbers was just to kind of feel that, that I think I think it's pretty close of what you know what we did in West Michigan beginning in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, maybe something that you guys consider doing here uh, um, and from both the staff and areas we did in the region. A couple more uh, tidbits on West Michigan. Uh, we have 135 uh, companies, uh, international companies in West Michigan, and lots of languages spoken. Um, Several publicly traded company. We do a large amount of exports, as you might expect. Uh, as Mary mentioned, we were highly, highly a um, manufacturing economy. Uh, so we have office furniture and automotive, uh, very big in West Michigan, mostly suppliers, uh, which we supply those to the trade unions. And we have three very specific products here one supplier that uh, sell a lot of their products internationally. I just have a snapshot of, of a couple of our companies that are in the region with us. So. Some of them you may be familiar with, some of them you may not. ADAC Automotive is a tier one supplier. Amway Corporation, Crystal Corporation, you're familiar with the strategy we use in the region. Howard Miller and Herman Miller. Uh, Howard Miller is a box, Herman Miller is an office furniture company. Uh, Hazelworth, office furniture, um, are all headquartered uh, or have large offices uh, in, in one West Michigan. So there's some indication that we'll bring a wide by a couple of these um, uh, Brooks, Brooks, who's that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, So the, the, the one thing that's unique about West Michigan is that we started, this started back in the 80s. There, there are a handful of families in West Michigan that, that get along pretty well, which is wonderful. Uh, and, they're, and they've been lucky enough to have very, very, very successful companies. Uh, and many of them are the poorest ones. And so those group, that group got together and they called and created something, their economic development group called the Right Place. And now the Right Place program, uh, every five years, reinvents itself and says, what, what economy should we be running in? Uh, sort of a revolving five-year plan of what we want to do. This represents the latest five-year plan. So our focus now is in the areas that you see listed there, which include I said these are the of the region, uh, car manufacturing, agribusiness, uh, life science, biotech, technology communication, and commercial design. What I'm going to focus on, oh, sorry. What I'm going to focus on today is uh, life sciences and the communications example. Companies are going to give our staff here because that's area I work in both the venture side as well as the data analyst, data analyst business. But the interesting thing about the right place program, the economic development that we've been created, um, is um, when the families want to do, and I, I call the families like it's uh, like the mafia, it's not like the mafia at all. Um, <laughs> when, when, they, when they want to change the economy, um, several of them are, are 
least at the Meyer family, we all know that we're not worth a billion dollars. We might not give money back and bring back in the cost. That's something that's important to us. Uh, what can we do infrastructure wise in our community? What can we do to invest in health sciences and to look for the health sciences? And then I get the economic run up of that. The decision wasn't set, wasn't made to say we want to do life sciences, we have economic impact. In their case, it was we want to focus, we want to do life sciences, build an infrastructure, we want to invest in health. And the result of that was the economic impact. And that has that has changed that story. I'm not going to read this but um, this is right off of our this is from our, from our economic development group. Um, very big. Um, uh, we have building there is the children's uh, uh, the Boss Children's Hospital, one of the top ten most popular now in the country after the whole thing in the line. Uh, so Meyer Heart Center over there does more heart procedures than anybody else in the state of Michigan, including the University of Michigan and Detroit. Uh, this is a health this is a lax cancer center at St. Mary's, which is half mile away. And this is a health science park that has been uh, prepared to result in the next mile away. And from the bottom there is a picture of uh, the Indian Hills. So this is what it looks like today. And obviously, we have another helicopter up in the long range process, but we're going to do some good research, research on it. We just have it yet. Um, and it's a good news, bad news story. It's cost $3.5 million to, to put in place uh, over this year. Um, and uh, that's good news. Bad news is um, it's 
I mentioned uh, there's, there's been two enterprises there, 350 scientists and staff in the building. Uh, we're almost done with phase two build out now. We still have more 600 scientists and staff from all our laboratories are built out. In the Daniel Church, our chairman, uh, you know me already. Peter Jones is our scientific director, our, our officer. He's been number one for the graph, two of the top reviews in the last mile. And then Tara Durango runs our educational division. So as we focus on the much focus on those barriers to innovation and, and, and we talked about when we start. So the business people, the scientists, scientists, clinicians all get together and determine what those are and plan in place to mitigate those. Uh, so the reason we're doing that is we're doing it creatively in a, in a gravitational pull from our team. We have to fight about what we do that. So I'll slide the board with all these life scientists. So we want to be one of the top 10 life science We want to do some collaboration. And then the second, I'll tell you one way we're doing that with the whole of cancer um, and how, how we're uh, doing something that others haven't done. So we want to be the world's best on understanding the, the biology of the disease that we're treating people with. We want to make sure that we can sit in any world state, anywhere and say, listen, I understand the epigenetics of, of this particular mechanism and that particular disease better than anybody in the world. We want to make sure we understand that. Well, the problem with that is uh, that doesn't necessarily directly relate to how healthy we are. How do we get through to infection and health of the Van Allen family if we want to do from phase two? That's one of the challenges. Thank you. 
ensure that that barrier, that we both see together, uh, between here and there, so we can get a little bit of that. So uh, you might recognize some of the logos in there. Uh, one of them you won't recognize likely is one of the thin ones. So we have a we have a joint laboratory in Shanghai, China. Uh, one of our investigators for Fisher Seven Science Fair last year and one of the fifty people studying molecular uh, uh, So they study only. They studied the lab in lab in China, but they studied the science of the drugs in lab in China. And that one, for example, has generated now three drug candidates that have been licensed to them. But we then expand on that to include the our research partners that are necessary along with that, right? So those include the pharmaceutical companies, those include uh, the government agencies that are necessary to get approved, uh, the, the regulatory agencies. And so we bring them all together. And so one example, example I, that I'll give you is, uh, as I mentioned, with the Standard Cancer Project. So last Friday, we did some projects in uh, LA at the Standard Cancer Method, an annual event that we mentioned in the show, the TV show, you know, Friday night. Um, it's a fascinating event. Um, but Standard Cancer is a philanthropic organization, and they had a great idea. They said, hey, listen, they too saw the same, some of the same barriers that we saw. We can't get clinical researchers to work together in a way, and drug companies to work together in a way that gets, in, gets the drug idea from idea to patient faster. And so what we're going to do is we're going to force two institutions to work together. You have a proposal and you want the funding. You have to have two separate institutions come together, write a proposal, give it to us, and call it a dream team. So it's like cancer, you know, breast cancer, dream team, or genetic dream team. And then you're going to tell us what you're going to do with the drug company. You're going to take that drug company from the beginning to end your idea, all the way from the beginning to end and have an impact. And they do that very well. Well, one of the dream teams was the epigenetic dream team. That was Peter Jones' dream team. He's Baylor and Hopkins dream team. And Peter said, hey, listen, I think there's a better way to do this. I, I love the base idea, but let's let's take it to the next next level. And how we did that is we said, um, we all the first year and a half of the dream team was the, was, was the contracting and the green team, the green design, getting all the hurdles out of the way. So then we can actually start the trial to see if it actually worked, our idea actually worked. Now we've done that, we did the long trial, it was almost done, and it's like, well, we're gonna disband this team, which is crazy. We already did that. And it's long the screen and extend the screen. And we did. So it took five years, four and a half years for this first one study to be getting to the uh, Now, the next study, we've already launched one this year. We're launching two more in the next, in the next 60 days. And we'll launch two more next year. So we'll have five studies launched in the two and a half years period on the shoulders of the original team. Uh, why this is unique is it typically doesn't happen that two philanthropic organizations came together to get money to the same thing because one of them wants to stand in front of the idea. Number two is, the, that, that team now represents Johns Hopkins, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Fox Shape Cancer Center, USC, and University of Notre Dame. You don't have five institutions come together and not kill each other. They just do the same thing now. Uh, and we can. And we're launching, we're launching these studies at a much greater clip because we saw the barrier. And so we fixed that picture. And that's one example of, of an application within the NLP that we're doing. So now let's look for the business here. Let me take this as a business example that I have of, of, of some of the success that we've had. So on the far left hand side, I, I don't have a detailed example of that. That was a, a technology that was created by Dr. George Vanderwood, uh, who was a uh, founder and creator of biomolecular mechanisms, very important in metastatic cancer. Uh, and he had an antibody created for diagnostic purposes. He likened that out by the best drug company in, in California. Uh, we also started a company uh, called the High Complexity Glia Lab. Uh, he wanted to run a commercialized medicine study in the early days before anybody else was doing it. And there were no labs that could do it. So we, the hospital spent the most and us the money in the pocket. We started high collecting the lab just to run the study. Once the study was done, we sold the lab and continued to make the study. Uh, I'll talk a bit about more about trans study and in that episode of Century Manufacturing and some insights in that study for you in a little more detail. That would be okay if I had to all the air out of the room. You guys, I wanted to run this on the phone, but I only have a couple more slides I want to get to, but uh, but anyways, these 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 are the sample of small cell phone companies which they know that's directly involved in trade. Uh, uh, have generated uh, currently employees and their team invests in the revenue which is not small. Okay. So let me say about ground and say manufacturing. This is a life science company. Uh, they make uh, sterile filled finished products. What we found, once again looking at the barriers, a whole bunch of organizations across the country were creating these new antibodies that were biologic uh, that they could use drugs for the people going to do a biologic. The challenge with the challenge is instead of the oral drugs you normally take, uh, is they're very unstable and have to be injected. And so a lot of the companies, a lot of Research organizations that were creating them had no way to actually scale them up so they can actually distribute them beyond their, beyond their institution. Because they all got to phase one uh, studies, which are single site studies, but they could never go beyond, so they were running into a roadblock. So we said, well, why don't we build one of these facilities to try to happen? We said, in manufacturing, and kind of like life science, so let's do this. So we created this facility, um, and it, it actually, uh, it's a partnership. Again, every, you'll, you'll see a Scott Sabine or collaboration partnership across the country, like State University of West Michigan, uh, where we, in the state of Michigan, Gave us 
$5 million for the Washington building. Uh, we, we raised an additional $20 million on top of that, which provided that we have that capital box uh, to create the manufacturing facility. Um, and we have two sites now that do that. Uh, but this is the more exciting one. So over the past seven years, we have 130 employers. Uh, this year, we'll actually probably get closer to a $70 million revenue and about $2.5 million in the profit. Um, but the nice thing, the great thing from a manufacturing standpoint about this is you can't do this. Um, the facility, uh, how companies work, and you actually get licensed to make particular drug products. And once it's licensed, that company for a company like a Pfizer or an Ontario takes the drug out of your out of your out of your organization and moves to another organization, takes several million dollars in a couple of years of production loss. So you can't move it. So it's a beautiful manufacturing opportunity that you once you have them, you, unless you're really screwed up, they're pretty much customer. Another example is a company that Mary is very familiar with called Transcept Systems. This is one of our first companies that we launched out of the Um And uh, it's personalized, it's personalized medicine software company. It saw a problem in the, in the space that Mary clearly saw when she was in Chicago at, at, at the research center. And that is, I have all this research data, I have all this clinical data, I have all this patient data, both, both, both real time and historical. I have all this molecular data. How can I, how can I weave the story through that that I can actually treat the patient and say, how do I go about doing that? How do I organize that? Um, <coughs> the healthcare system in the United States is not uh, all that great right now. One of, one of probably the, the biggest Achilles heel of the healthcare system is the ability to negotiate the system. So it's beautiful. This system was designed to start doing that. And so this, this timeline there, you'll see uh, Lori, Lori Childers, who works for Mary Apple, worked first. She was using to say, hey, listen, I see this thing coming off. You guys see it. I'm going to be a data type to see if we can put this thing together. Uh, and we did, and uh, there are several great stories uh, within Lori where Mary's research group was finding things, working with clinicians at the hospital that were applied, that were applied to the patient setting very, very quickly. Uh, you see the answer to these articles, and, and, and tell them that we find that we can do it. And that company has gone on and, and, and continued to generate significant revenue, and what it's doing is, as I mentioned before, and what we're going to apply is organizing all these disparate data types uh, so that I can, if you showed up in the hospital, I can say, based on the history of all the data that I've organized, you look a lot like this. And the left ear looks like this, or, 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 or your, your blood cells look like this. This is the likely outcome you're going to go to. I'm going to, put, I'm going to monitor you and more people to in place to ensure that you don't get where that person is. Uh, and it, it, it is wonderful, and it, and it really is. But the organization to say this is not as trivial. It's not as trivial. It took a long time to get it going, uh, the company going. These are some of the companies that uh, are the organizations that the company works with today um, to, to make that happen and see the benefit of what it's really doing. Um, and so, what they started, other people like Mary saw in the early days have now started saying, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, we put a collaborative network together to actually start getting together using your system um, so that not only can I look at stuff that comes in Northwestern and, and focus on Chicago, but I want to look at their side, I want to look at stuff in Chicago on an anonymized basis to make sure or in, in Detroit. On a anonymized basis to get to the parallel regions on that sort of stuff. And so the company's now starting to ramp up pretty quickly uh, in its revenue and, and, and the number of employees. Currently, they have 32 employees. We also, we also have around 20 that go to some of And last, last little vignette um, company wise, this is on the education side, it's not with that very bad. Um, one of the things that the video things I mentioned before was very passionate about making sure that the patient is around when they reach the So they great, great things that someday can say, my dad worked in that building. And, and it's still there. And it's these, these things over the years of time do that. We have to have science education work well. Well, science education in the United States, problem solving based education in the United States, science being the, the lead indicator of that, uh, doesn't go very well. So on the far left hand side, over you see, um, at third grade level, I believe is the first one, um, kids perform about 32% uh, of, of what you expect to be at grade level uh, in third grade. By the time they get to 12th grade level, that drops to 21%. And that's a natural phenomenon. Our system, uh, educational system in the United States, seems to beat that out of them. It could be as much more focused as all the football players back to the school or high school. It's about the grade, it's about getting this done. But I don't really care about the data. I just want to make them get the grades. I care about the individual situation. I can see what I need to do to get them locked down. Um, as opposed to saying, what's the problem? What's the true learning that's happening? And this is evidence in a study that was done um, by NASA, actually by George Land at NASA, some time ago. He was commissioned by NASA to do this study. And they said, hey, listen, we want to innovate. Much like you guys do, we want to innovate at least six years. Um, and what, what does innovate? How do I know if she's an innovator, better innovator than he is? And I want to make sure that if she is, I'm going to get her more resources so she can innovate and move us forward faster. So George Ryan put together a very easy set of tests that anybody can benefit from. And, and the tests were about asking you, here's the problem. How many solutions can you come up with to this problem? Uh, they could be whacked out crazy solutions, but how many solutions can you come up with? Be better than that. And um, we <laughs> Well, come to find, he 
study those, they're pretty easy. Ah, I can't study about it. But it's already computer code people to it. Or five year olds, I mean five year olds. And uh, on the five year olds, it has your mighty success. 98% of them were, were, were rated at a 90 at, at a genius level, an innovative genius level by the same that age. Why? Because they have no constraints, right? They, they, there's, you know, how would you do that? Well, I I I I can read the room with hot. I mean, crazy. If you discount the media, they have the knowledge to be able to do that. So it was 98%. Well, by the time those hit that same statistic that are tracking five years later, you still get a kind of average of 30%. So as they get into this system of education, the education system may not have not a direct cause and effect, but certainly related to their focus in that focus on what they're doing. That's up 30%. By the time they were 15, that's up 12%. And um, similar to the NASA uh, scientists that he uh, monitored, by the time they got to adults, they were at 50%. So of the people in the room, the adults in the room, maybe the people in the back of our younger, um, were not innovative geniuses as a matter of course. They were forced themselves in front of you and then they would use the problems, uh, solutions to problems that are presented to us. So we saw that problem as well. And we thought, oh my gosh, if we could just capture what's happening in the young child um, and, and, and maintain that excitement, interest, and give them tools within any system uh, that parallels that K-12 system to their career, they'll go well and have those problems all the time. Not to be scientists, but great lawyers and great business leaders are also going to be able to solve problems. Uh, so how can we give them those skills and those tools to do that? So we started regionally uh, playing with uh, a, group of, a group of folks that, uh, in our region, very school leaders in the region. We developed a model uh, that seemed to parallel well and work with any curriculum anywhere. And so we started training these, these 30 school districts uh, and their teachers, their primarily their science teachers, how to teach this in the, in the classroom. Well, it's now morphed into the social studies teachers are using it, science teachers are using it, and a whole bunch of other computer studies. And this stepwise process that you naturally go through as a two year old, you're, you're, you're a natural innovator as a two year old, you're a natural innovator. Uh, and so, how that worked was we took the model and we, uh, we, we had uh, you know, handwritten notes and we had stickers. So, you know, what is your prediction and what's your, you know, what's your idea and what's your question and how are you working and what are your ideas? helping them organize their thinking through the structure. We said, well, this is great. We can't scale this. We could do it for our third. We could do it with Alpha Bravo. Especially, but I can't, I can't do it in West Virginia. I can't do it in Alpha Bravo. How do I figure, figure this out? We said, let's just invest in an innovative software company that creates this tool. We uh, uh, call it Next Gen Inquiry that brings these two worlds together. And that's what we did. Uh, it's a tool that provides student journals, teacher journals, and classroom infrastructure for any curriculum in the country. And what's your K-12 science teachers to quickly help them take their, their traditional lesson plan, uh, apply it through the system so that kids can, can use the problem, problem solving what we want them to use to ensure that they're thinking in a way that problems don't need to be uh, And so we launched that last last year. Uh, the first year of operations is our second year, uh, second fall that we have right now. We have 24 teachers online, a little over 10,000 students, uh, 30, about 40,000 assignments have been generated through the system in the first year. And uh, we have teachers from all 50 countries, all 50 states, and uh, 20 regions in the world. We're hoping we're homing to double or triple those numbers in the next uh, number coming. But that's not a spin out, that's within our organization. We've got an interesting person to take already, uh, uh, not an entrepreneur, an introvert, uh, uh, Mr. Pereira, who's going to be focus on this. So that's my snapshot of, of that, that's the end of the Western Virginia story. Don't Western Virginia story. So then Mary informed me that if you want to talk about economic development, um, what do you know about economic development? I'm like, I, I do the other stuff. I really, I mean, I only know economic development through running businesses. I don't know economic development or economic development. But I do know, uh, I can take time to look at what's going on in your region. So what I did is I went out and looked at other incubators, other uh, people around here and what they're doing. So this is a snapshot of the Virginia small business incubators that they have. Um, and, it's, uh, and they seem to focus largely on IT and life sciences as well, at least in my first year, you know, we started that. But, um, this is a snapshot of the Maryland, the Maryland incubators that are out there. Uh, right on your borders, and then uh, this is a snapshot not of your not, not of your incubators per se that's in here, but a whole bunch of uh, uh, groups and you know, these specialty areas that we have uh, throughout West Virginia. On the left, on, on your left hand side over there, I also highlighted some of the state funding that seems to be the bill for innovation. This is definitely not exhaustive, but this is just the Jerry Callahan Google group. So, um, you would once again, this is kind of an engaging conversation. I'd love to learn more, more about that um, and, and where we stand there. But there is already some mechanisms in place.
money is put back because it's really government has a significant investment in it. And so they had to apply a lot of those defense funds, a lot of those defense dollars went into research and development and generate a whole bunch of really cool things. You know, it's a whole bunch of other cool things. And they've already spent all this money creating these things. So much of these technologies and entrepreneurs can figure out an application for those and put some kind of economic impact. And they did. They created a, a network of 24 active incubators throughout, throughout the state of Michigan, very small state, and the state of Michigan. And the goal was to transform technology by using what we had into early stage private investment. And uh, they provide these incubators, private work environments, administrative services, technology, and uh, business guidance, and regional regulation. And each of these incubators, in their case, are, are, are offered up. If you want to have an incubator, as a venture capital fund, you can own an incubator. You have to, you have to be able to provide the funding, you have to provide these services, and the state will provide them. They can start services before they come. The, they have 24 of those, they have 24 different venture funds that fund them. I don't know how many venture funds fund them, but that's fund them only one of them. And what happens is, uh, an entrepreneur comes with an idea, they propose it to the federal government, they have to you know, fill off a proof with them, it's a very small proposal. They can ask for over five to eight hundred thousand dollars Fifteen percent of that budget is provided by uh, the venture capital fund or the fund that owns that incubator. Eighty-five percent of the budget is budget funded by the government. Uh, the government gets paid back. Uh, it gets paid back if the company is successful uh, as a loan and it's just a loan repayment. The company then is has to to do whatever it does with technology. See if they can stay local, or many of the companies already it's already in Europe and successful in the Europe and the United States to pay royalties back and impose the obligations that are on the uh, back to the check to the government. And uh, of the 108 active companies they have right now, 50% uh, are like branches, 50% are in the impact, 30% uh, are in the IT, 30% are in the impact, 5% of it. Largely, most of these companies are leveraging to get an IT credit for the government. Uh, defense, uh, the defense and IT community, so they're in the government. And they have a pretty good track record. 700 plus companies have entered this and they have graduated uh, and generated additional $3.5 billion worth of investment. So this, I, I thought this was a new comparison today. If you guys are considering going to model to West Michigan, or West Virginia, you might want to find this. Is, this is, I don't know if this model will work, but you can make it. So with that, I really have my last slide. Uh, so I got the slide I want to get to, which is the happy hour series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they're going to fail. It's a very recent life science of a very 
very very risky. Yeah, that's what it does. Was you drive you a hundred million dollars through here? You employ the five hundred people for a two-year period of time across fifteen different companies. Two of the companies made it. Those people all pay tax and are also here. I mean, that, if you redefine success that way in the early days, it's much easier to get legislators to look at it. And rightly so. Uh, but if you redefine it as if you give us the money, we're going to have a billion dollar company. Do you ever see any of these investors or people trying to get into the environment? Go after it. Yeah, um, actually, that, that's that's a, that's, a big, that's a great question. So, my, I talked to my tech transfer hat, one of the one of the groups I run on the institute is developing tech transfer. And so, if uh, we always say what we need is we need, we need two scientists that all have thought of before we start anything. What I mean by that is I need I need two different individuals that all thought of the same scientific idea that they want to pursue together, uh, both internally or internally and externally. And the externally could be with Pfizer. Pfizer could say, hey, listen, we really want to have a drug in the market that gets the bad compound. Uh, we don't have one. You have a guy who really knows that and loves that. Um, can you, you know, can we design a protocol together, sponsor research agreement together that at the end of it will run it? So we 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 work with, uh, at any given time with probably have 18 and 19 drugs on our uh, major pharmaceutical drug company contract that we can you know, have been able to do funding ideas. Now many of those ideas have they have looked at the big companies we have an option to go back to them. So you did the great work, you got some funding, but the idea that you can take credit for and never make it to the market is going to be largely uh, and grow out of thematic and provide an example of Pfizer. But yes, we do we have all the smaller companies that are, you know, that will say, uh, not outside the analysis of one, some medical advice takers, some early engineering can do Listen, I want to do this thing, this is what you do, you have an expertise, you'd be interested in doing this, this is your fall in love, they fund it, and then they run the own it, and then we do spin up. Sure. Yeah, we're smart. We're going to do. We're going to create a fifty million dollars company, and we're going to do innovation. 
Um, and but more importantly, you have the, have the idea of how you generate it. You generate it anywhere, but the company has to be launched and, and you know, hundreds of people have to be held to the um, Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a dollars pretty quick. Uh, and, and with no company on it, um, no, no real company on it. And because the ideas are fungible, ideas move across borders, money moves across borders. Uh, but we, you can't, to try to control it, like try to control the river in the state, which we try to guide it though. Get, get the fraction and try to get, get the river to go where we want it to go. Uh, but if you define success as this is an investment, either either a success is um, some of our investors locally invest in this thing, we made money, which kept tax dollars here and kept people here in Florida, that's good. Uh, if, if, uh, another portion of success would be we have a company that failed, but we had 15 people employed for five years, uh, three of which now have new companies that they're trying to start. That's a win. So you really take the time to define what the wins are. If, the, if you're going to define the win as a successful company that happens to support a sale, that really makes you very disappointed. I guess we'll get a ton of those later, but we're going to put it in the Okay, go back to uh, Pascal. Actually, multi part questions here. It has to do with your first answer. Um, when you were considering the, uh, the tax burden that the state took on to assist you in this process, um, what what kind of number was that? Yeah, so in fact, I, I, I didn't do the slide plan. I did, I did look at so, so largely the state of Michigan, when they first pushed through this, it was back up to the money. It's the same back up to the money that went to Western Michigan. Ours was a large percentage of the population, was slightly higher than the state. But it wasn't too much higher. Ours higher. I, think, I think ours, I'm going to go from number here, so go quote me on this. I think over from 1998 to the last chapter or so, I think it was like about four or five billion dollars was going through the state to capture that money, of which they gave about 252 million into economic development and life sciences specifically. Uh, that was one of the that was one of the uses of that. A lot of it was in general fund. I think you guys were about a hundred billion, uh, a billion one or billion two of that same for that same cell. I don't know where yours went. Um, <laughs>
as part of scenario planning, did you use any kind of quantitative tools, particularly to look at the assumptions and you know, the right behavioral assumptions that go around investment decisions from multiplier effects and so on? Um, and, and what indications of advice do you have for this part of this behavior? And it's a great question. I don't know. Well, the question. question like what tools and uh, you know, uh, quantitative tools might I want to use or didn't we use in this? Um, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I forget that. I know what the goal is. So, my venture capital hat on now, or my private equity hat on. So, we have phenomenal tools that we use in that, right? Um, um, this is the best tool. Um, they're, you know, can't have it. But it is, you know, it, it's still predicting the worst ways. And as the worst ones to run, you got to do what they're going to do. And even the tool would suggest that if we're going to eat well and sleep well, if less more racing and we're improving every time, this should be a good thing. So um, we do that venture capital all the time. Uh, uh, looking at stocking horses is you know, high, high risk, broad, in a high target market. This is what, what we're very good at in that tool defining. We're going we're to call the ball here. If it doesn't make it here, chances of making it there are very bad, very difficult. Now we're talking about people that I like. Right? I'm on a board and I'm a person. I like it. We agreed up front but at the end, you know what? We didn't know. That's a really difficult conversation. So I'm, I'm answering your question um, uh, in two ways. One is yes, on the venture side, we absolutely do that. Um, but it, it still is slightly bit, bit different, better version of the Canada. Um, uh, yeah, on the on the non life science side, within the incubators, yeah, they do that. So manufacturing stuff is a lot more commercial, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's consistent with people. If I don't have a customer by this point, at this level, in this market, I know that the chance of that company making it is fine. And so in this model, you know, models, we, we have our own custom model, but those are easy to develop models based on industry standards. Okay, let's go to
that get more than your grade street as well. Um, we have 25 women, uh, which is great. Before we started, we had about 200 people in Michigan. And so that works. That, that's a huge one. This story here will be quick. Uh, school systems are tough. Are tough on that. And they're, they're administrators, they're regulatory, they're just uh, mandatory. Um, so, so what we try to do, and we're trying to do, we're, we're, we're pivoting a bit. And what I started to do at the end before I handed off the chair was try to make it more like Google Docs. Try to put the teacher that is coming to the back room, right? So I make it available, and then teachers suck it in the school. But right? once it's in the school, I have two teachers who do it in school, then I, I tell the principal or the superintendent, because I didn't know if you do this, that we have four people in your company software. And that's your best work. And I would love to have all of your teachers learn the same way about the um, So it's a little bit of a step up here. Thank <laughs> you. 